So the question now becomes, how does Jesus fulfill the law? Okay, we're going to look at Matthew 5, 17. Don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've, I haven't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. We'll look at that. But first, let's go in order. And I'll say this up front, and then I'll confirm it with Scripture and Scripture and Scripture and Scripture, not eisegeting, uh, which is to take Scripture out of context and then isolate that. I'm not doing that. I'm not using you know proof text to make a point that the Scripture doesn't make. But I will tell you, what it means for Jesus to fulfill the law, as we'll see, he does not just do the law perfectly. He is not just the embodiment of the law in with arms and legs. He's not just the personification of the law in its entirety and perfection. He does embody the law. He does do the law perfectly in our place as the perfect human that represents us and is our mediator. But the law does not just instruct. The law you know, the first five books, the Torah of the Hebrew Bible, the law also prophetically predicts who Jesus is. Even within the smallest detail of the, of the ceremonial laws and the dietary laws, those all and the underlying wisdom within those laws speak to who Christ is in his very nature and what he will do in his work. So the law doesn't just instruct and point to Jesus in a way where it's like, Jesus will fulfill these rules. The law also prophetically points to Christ in a predictive manner where it lays out what he will be like. So again, the law is not just something to do. The law and what is required in the law, that's something to be. And Jesus is the embodiment of all that the law requires. Okay, so Matthew chapter 3 verse 15, Jesus telling John the Baptist, we got to but ton of scriptures to go over. So I'm not going to spend too much time on these smaller portions of scripture. I want to save a lot of our time for the bigger portions. Jesus answers John the Baptist. Hey, I know you're really wondering about baptizing me. So here's how he answers. Let it be so now. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, to achieve the end of righteousness, to accomplish righteousness to fill righteousness up to its full. Jesus comes to fulfill all righteousness. What God requires of the perfect human, Jesus comes to do that. Okay? Matthew eleven thirteen. All the prophets and the law prophesied until John. This is key. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. What is interesting is that Jesus explicitly says that the prophets and the law prophesied not until Christ, until John. John seems to signal the end of something, the end of an era. By being the messenger that goes before the Messiah, he seems to signal, maybe with his own ministry, he is the last of the prophets that prophetically de declare the coming Messiah. But also, John is actually said to be the greatest in terms of being born of woman. Why? Every other prophet said he's coming. John says he's here. So John in his ministry seems to mark the end of an era, enter in Christ, right? So John will decrease and Jesus will increase. Uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 16 and 17 says this, The law and the prophets were until John, since then... Since when? Since John started his ministry of preparing the way for the Messiah, the good news of the kingdom is preached. The kingdom of God is preached. John does preach, repent. The king is coming, right? And everyone forces his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So even Jesus admits, not a single dot, what is written of the law, will never become void. So we have to hold on to that as we move forward and look at what it means that Jesus fulfills the law. We know this, there is not a voiding of the law, there is a completion. Voiding means this was never helpful, this is not useful. Completing means 
I have achieved its intended end and it played its role in this season of human history, but now it functions like this now that I've fulfilled it. And I, I'm not just, you know, giving you no scripture to back that statement. I'm just trying to show you where we're going. He does say, not a dot of the law. And this is where people will typically say, see, nothing about the law of Moses is something that we're exempted from. In other words, they'll use this to say, hey, everything about the law that you possibly can do, it is still applicable to the life of the new covenant believer. Okay. Now that is a lot to read into that. That is a lot to read into that. I'm just saying it's not becoming void for sure. Jesus will actually say in Matthew 5, and again, here's where we get the language of fulfilling, not abolishing, not voiding, not, a, not, you know, um, what the, what the heck? So Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So when I tell you, I wasn't just inserting my own commentary in the previous verse. Like this verse confirms that Jesus fulfills, which means there is an intended end for Jesus to achieve with the law. The law and the prophets have an intended uh, end point. And Jesus marks that. He achieves that. He's the culmination of that. The law and the prophets point to him. He's the substance of everything we see in the Old Testament. And we'll go on, because I know some people will go, hey, you didn't read the last part. Okay, hold on, geez. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, until heaven and earth pass away, can we agree that heaven and earth are going to pass away? Sure. That's why he says until. He uses it as a, as a time marker. When heaven and earth pass away, until that comes, you know, before then, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law. And people go, ah, yes, see, we told you nothing about the Mosaic law has been uh, voided in terms of this doesn't apply to the Christian. Everything about the Mosaic law still applies to the Christian. Well, hold on. He says until all is accomplished. What's going to be accomplished? Well, beep, bop, boop. It's right there in verse 17. The law being accomplished or all being accomplished refers to Jesus fulfilling the law or the prophets. I don't think the all being accomplished here refers to heaven and earth passing away. Okay, so what we know is that not a dot will pass from the law. And again, here's a time marker until, until. So we have to ask ourselves, just like he says in Luke 16, he says, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away, okay, than for one dot of the law to become void. Maybe I'll recant my statement about this, and I'm just saying this. It's almost like I didn't read it the first time. He says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Is he saying one dot of the law will never become void? I initially read it like that, as if Jesus is saying, yeah, this is an impossibility that, you know, there's not a single dot within the law itself that will ever become void. If heaven and earth are indeed going to pass away, um, and that's actually going to happen, as we see in scripture, heaven and earth will pass away. He's saying it's easier for that to happen than for one dot of the law to become void. Does that now make this uh, like realistic and possible? In terms of, and again, we have to define what it means for this to be voided. Um, I don't think it's, again, saying this has zero use at all throughout human history. But I will say, Jesus comes to fulfill. And I think that's part of what it means for the law or for all things to be accomplished. Maybe, and again, when you read the Old Testament, there's lots of things that have yet to happen that are going to happen at the second coming of Christ, for sure. So maybe the all being accomplished here is firstly Jesus coming to fulfill 
everything we see in the Old Testament, and secondarily, when he comes back to establish new creation, that will mark the completion of everything that we see in the Old Testament as regards the future. Meaning, he says, truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, which again speaks to an actual time, there that will happen. Until that happens, okay, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So maybe the time marker here is heaven and earth. Maybe it is Jesus fulfilling on the cross when he says it is finished, or maybe it's a combination of both. But no matter what, there is an accomplished end. There is something to be fulfilled, right, within the law. And when he says law here, we know he's speaking to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There, I'm just trying to show you, there is an intended end. And does Jesus mark that? And what does that mean? Um, if it won't be abolished, and let me look up this word real quick. That would have been helpful, huh? Would have been helpful, but I didn't do it. So let's look it up. Matthew 5.17. Okay, let's go to the Greek. Specifically here in Matthew 5, to render vain, to annul, to discard. Mm, okay, I'm down, I'm down. Okay, let's move forward. I think there are gonna be some things, because here, here's what people will say. When, when Jesus says not a dot from the law will, will, uh, will pass, they think that means the law will always be applicable to all the people of God throughout human history. I think there's something else in mind. Meaning, everything we see in the law, it's still true. When we say, like for instance, if you're speaking to me and you go, hey, does the law, the entire Mosaic law still apply to new covenant believers? And I go, well, not really. You go, ah, see, you're saying the law is no longer true. And I go, no, it's still truth. It's still true for the people of God. It's still true in that, you know, but the, the way that truth functions and applies now is different. For instance, was it true that God told Abraham to sacrifice his son? For sure, right? Is God going to tell me to do that? I sure hope not. But if he does not tell me, right, then that means that truth had a different function in the life of Abraham than mine. That It is true that happened, but that's not going to specifically apply to my life. Maybe there's wisdom to, to draw out of it or any other instance in the Old Testament where God tells truth to a person, right? Or he tells, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, um, I don't know, anything in the Old Testament that you see that actually happened. It is still true today, that really happened. But it's it's the way that truth functions or applies in a season of human history. Something can be true back then that, um, I don't know. We'll get to that when we get to that. I can't think right now, I need more juice. Uh, verse 19, this is where people will say, you didn't read the whole thing, okay, calm down. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments. What commandments? Well, relating to the law, I guess. Is he speaking to the, the book of the law? Is he speaking to the Ten Commandments? Let's keep reading. And teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Ah, whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now here's how to make sense of it. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So part of what it means for someone to relax these commandments, it has to do with the standard of righteousness the scribes and the Pharisees set. In other words, the scribes and the Pharisees of the day were notorious for almost lowering the bar and the standard of God so that anyone can actually meet the law. And then therefore, they had a sense of self-righteousness. And Jesus is saying, no, the, the standard of righteousness that the Pharisees and scribes have, the self-righteousness they have, you have to exceed that if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven. You have to exceed that. They've lowered the bar. They've relaxed the least of the, they've relaxed the commandments of God in terms of saying, hey, 
The, the standard of God is something we can meet. They brought the bar down low enough for people to meet. Whereas the, the law, the standard of God is supposed to function in a way where it exposes your inability to enter the kingdom. So again, when Jesus says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, someone who really thinks the Mosaic law applies to a Christian will say, see, if you say anything within the Mosaic law does not apply to us, you are relaxing one of the least of these commandments. Jesus is saying, is warning people who soften the demands and expectations of the law here. People are doing that. They're softening the blow. They're making the law they're taking the teeth out of the law and saying, well, you can actually meet it. I mean, look at the righteousness of the Pharisees. Well, Jesus is saying, yeah, their righteousness is self-righteousness. They ain't getting into the kingdom. You got to go past that. How do you do that? Look at the law in its entirety and understand that standard is something you can't meet. Then you can come to a place where you need the righteousness of God and cry out for help. So Jesus is, so, is, is warning people not to lower the standard or the bar. Otherwise, they don't see their need for a savior. They think they can do the law on their own, which is what the religious leaders were doing. In other words, they would place, scripture does say that the religious leaders would place burdens on people the, that, they, that they would not lift with their own finger. They would place burdens on people. In other words, they would place the burden of fulfilling the law perfectly without relying on God or, 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 or admitting their inability, they would place that burden of fulfilling the law on the person and say, you can do this, and it's a burden they couldn't bear. So this is what happens when the law requirements are watered down. When you lower the standard of God, you think you can do something that you actually can't, and you carry a burden you're not meant to bear. Jesus carries the burden, if we can say it like that, carries the, the weight of the law on his shoulders. You don't. I don't. So when Jesus says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, I don't believe he's saying, if you say anything about the Mosaic law does not apply to new covenant saints. I, I don't think he's saying that. This is about, again, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law. And to keep that in mind, Jesus is talking about there is a righteousness that we don't have. And the law exposes that and speaks to that. And eventually the law will be accomplished and fulfilled by who? Jesus, who gives us righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. But if you relax one of the commandments of God and say, no, that's not a big deal, you're, you're stripping the law of its teeth. And you say, well, you don't need to do that in terms of like, you can do this and you can get to heaven. Then you are eliminating your need for Jesus's righteousness because you think you can do it on your own. So Jesus is also speaking of how the law will not stop being true. Again, when we, when we look at the Old Testament, we're not saying it's no longer true. Truth is applied in different situations in different ways. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I can't think of any good scenarios this morning because I'm just, I'm out of it. But let's go on. Okay. He's speaking to... Um, the actual truthfulness of the law itself. Not a dot will pass from it in terms of that. I think I'm going to continue to build this case. I don't think I've done a good job yet. And I get that. We're, we're barely getting our feet wet. Okay, so I'm going to stop saying things I haven't yet validated with Scripture. Luke 24, 44. Jesus says this. Remember, we're answering the question, what does it mean for Jesus to fulfill the law? Well, he's going to fulfill and not abolish uh, he's going to achieve its end. He's going to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, Jesus is walking with, um, he appears to the disciples here. Luke 24, 44. He says to them, these are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything written about me. Okay, everything written. Why can't I highlight this? Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, okay? Must be fulfilled. Jesus has already resurrected. So is there a fulfilling that is lacking or is he just speaking to the fact that I came to fulfill the law of Moses and, pro and the prophets and the Psalms? Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In other words, to see Jesus as being the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and the Psalms and the writings, okay? 
So Jesus sees himself. And this is not arrogance on any part. This is Jesus accurately seeing the scriptures. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms are written about Jesus. When you read the, the Old Testament, you should see Jesus. So the point is, he came to fulfill that. He sees himself as being prophetically declared and almost concealed within the New Testament until he opens the mind of the person to see it. Uh, John 15, 24, If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now they've seen and hated both me and my Father. Here's just one example of what it looks like for Jesus to fulfill. Okay, The word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Okay, And there he's quoting Psalm 35. So within their own law, it testifies within their own Hebrew Bible, it testifies to the fact that Jesus will be hated by his own people without a cause. And that had to be fulfilled. Um, Acts chapter 28, it says, when they had appointed a day for him, uh, this is Paul, uh, toward the end of the book of Acts, they came to him at his lodging uh, in greater numbers, the, the, the Jews of Rome. From morning till evening, he expounded to them. Look at what Paul's doing. Testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets. He's using the law and using the prophets to reveal the nature of Jesus and what he came to do and show them why Christ is the Messiah. Okay, Romans 8, 1 through 4, this is where we'll spend a little more time. Because again, we're answering the question, what does it mean for Jesus to fulfill the law? I think this is going to give us the clearest answer we've come across. Not just that the law prophetically declares who he is and what he'll do. Not just that the law sets the standard that Jesus will fulfill for us. right? Not just that the law tells humanity what we can't do so that Jesus can come and do it perfectly for us. But also Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation, penalty for sin, death. There's none of that for those who are in Jesus Christ. For the law of the spirit of life, and we'll address this more, a, a little more later when we talk about, I think, tomorrow's session. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. When he speaks to the law of sin and death, someone might be tempted to separate that from the actual Mosaic law. But in fact, those are the only two categories Romans uses, is the, the, the law um, of Moses versus what Romans 2 will speak to, and Romans 8 here speaks to, the law of the spirit of life. Um, so the law of sin and death here, someone might be tempted to say, that's not referring to the law of Moses because the law doesn't bring death. Actually, Romans 6 and 7 will tell us the law does bring death, not on its own, but sin actually taking advantage of the law brings more sin. So sin uh, exploits the law. Sin itself brings death through the law. Like if sin is a murderer coming into your house, the, the murder weapon is going to be wielded by him as the law, using the law to exploit and produce death. So the law of sin and death here isn't, and if you want to say, well, that's just speaking to like the law of gravity, how it functions, how sin and death function. Okay, you can't take the law out of the equation because again, sin brings death into the world through the law. Right? So the law can't be taken out of the equation. It's a part of this. Even if you say, well, it's not t speaking to the Mosaic law, it's still a part of it. It's still a part of the process of how death happens because God declared death happens because of sin. Sin exploits that. And Paul will speak to how, you know, I didn't know covetousness until I saw the law and sin, you know, took advantage and, and crept up more sin within me. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh is the law good yes it's just not helpful in saving it's useless when it comes to making us righteous and giving us you know a spot in the kingdom the law can't do that the law just exposes your problem and points you to the solution being jesus so god has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do 
the law being the entire Mosaic law, the entire old covenant, Sinai covenant, the flesh, right, weakened the law, and God steps in and goes, okay, I'll do what the law couldn't. I'll do what no other human could. And it's interesting. You go, how did God do what the law failed to do? Not that the, the law failed in that sense. The law was never purposed to save. The law was put in place, as we saw last session, to expose our inability and our sin, right? So that we cry out for help and point, point us to Jesus. So God steps in and does what the law was not brought into the world to do. There's a certain function the law doesn't have, and it doesn't save. God does. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. So this answers the question, how is there no condemnation for us? Well, because sin itself was punished, penalized, condemned in the flesh of Jesus who came from the Father to take on our sin. Verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And you go, well, where did we come from? Hold on. Where did we come from? Well, those of us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So where in the world, how do, how do we get thrown into this equation? It works like this. There is a righteous requirement the law has. If you want to get into the kingdom of God, you must meet this standard. You must meet these requirements. It's righteousness. We fall short. That's why Jesus in Matthew 3 says, I've come to fulfill all righteousness. He's come to fulfill and meet the demands of the law in our place. He's the perfect human we failed to be. He meets the law. He plays by his own rules. He comes under our own, you know, what Galatians is going to say. He comes under the law for us to rescue us from it. And he meets that standard, dies our death, takes our sin up within his own body, and sin is condemned in his flesh. And then he dies, he's buried. Three days later, he resurrects so that he took our sin. Now we can have his perfection in our life. So the righteous requirement of the law has been fulfilled in us. That's crazy. That's crazy. We fulfill the law, not on your own, in Christ, through your faith in him, through your attachment to him and your status and you being locked into him through faith, you fulfill the law just as he does. He extends to you his perfection. So part of Jesus fulfilling the law is doing what the law required for us so that we can fulfill the law with him. Um, let me take you to Luke 23 from the words of Jesus. Um, it was now about the sixth hour. This is Luke's gospel. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. I want to highlight this. The curtain. Now remember, the way that the temple was structured, there was the, the outer area where anyone can go. There was the actual um, inner place, uh, holy place you might say, where only the priests could go. And then that holy place had a curtain that separated it from the most holy place. So there were layers. There was the outer area, there was the inner, uh, the holy place, and then there was the most holy place. And the most holy place had a curtain that kept everyone out, except the high priest on the Day of Atonement, who would go in on behalf of Israel. So that curtain that separated the, the most holy place, the presence of God, and separated that from anyone on the planet, except the high priest on the Day of Atonement, that curtain right here is torn in two. Torn in two. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Okay? Mark will say something similar. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw 
the way Jesus breathed his last, like he yielded his spirit, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Now, I think Matthew is going to say something different, not like to contradict, but to fill in the gaps of what wasn't said. Um, why am I not finding it? Hold on one sec. Ah, it's John 19. Okay, no matter what, here we see, uh, where is it? Ba -ba 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 -ba. The curtain of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. John's gospel, I think it's John 19. John 19, 28, it says this. After this, Jesus, knowing all was finished, he said, to fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When he says, I thirst, apparently Psalm 69, 21 is in mind. Watch. When Jesus received the sour wine, which was to be symbolic of the wrath of God or the cup of God's wrath, which sour grapes, Old Testament language and symbology, represented of Jesus taken on our punishment and our condemnation and our death, he said, watch, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What was finished? What exactly was finished? What exactly did he fulfill? Well, it seems to be, you might say, well, he, he fulfilled or finished the work he was sent to do. Okay, but you can't ignore the fact that in Matthew 5, 17, that plays into Jesus fulfilling the law and the prophets themselves. Not a section of it, but the law and the prophets in their substance and entirety are fulfilled by Jesus. He says, it is finished, it is done. The righteous requirement that the law demands and expects of humanity, he fulfills that perfectly in our place by taking our death. So, let me take you to John 14, 6. Because when it says that the curtain was torn in two, which is symbolic of the work of Jesus being finished or is symbolic of the law reaching its completion or desired end or Jesus fulfilling the law. When that curtain is torn, it represents something that Jesus hints at in John 14. He tells Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, hold on, Jesus, you're saying you're the way into the kingdom of heaven? He goes, not necessarily. I'm being more specific. Yes, I'm the only way into the kingdom, but more specifically, I'm the way back to the Father. It's not just about getting into some glorious kingdom where everything's great. It's about getting back to him. And so the curtain kept people out, right? The curtain seems to be symbolic or representative of what Jesus came to fulfill being the law and the prophets. There's something about the righteous requirement of the law that kept us out. No one could get in. No one can get near the presence of God. So God comes down to us. His son says, guess what? Now you don't have to go through some curtain. Only the high priest could only do that on the day of atonement anyway. Now you can go through me to get to the father. In other words, the reason the temple curtain is torn is because Hebrews will tell us through the flesh Jesus of Jesus, the curtain he opened is himself. So now we can enter into the Holy of Holies, the true Holy of Holies, and be filled with the presence of God through him. So the curtain of the temple was always to be representative of, yes, the law and the prophets and the standard we couldn't meet, but namely Jesus who fulfills that and becomes the way in. So Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Okay, it says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. We have what? Well, this strong hope that Jesus set before us, right? We have a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. So I'm not making this up. The author of Hebrews himself says, you can enter into what the curtain kept from you at one point. Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
So now it's not, hey, the high priest has to go in once a year to atone for the people of Israel's sin. Now it's Jesus is the perfect high priest who every other person failed to be. No other high priest could meet the standard. No other high priest had an indestructible life. No other priest actually came directly from the Father. So Jesus is our high priest, and he grants us entrance into the true Holy of Holies, which symbolically was behind the curtain. Because he is the way in. He is the curtain we pass through to get to the Father. And he mediates a new covenant as the perfect high priest that allows us to go in. So he's not some high priest that's like, sorry, buddy, you can't get in. I'm a little better than you. He comes down into our world to bring us into the actual presence of God so that we can become the living temple. We can become the living temple as the people of God. That's what the temple structure was always to represent is the people of God, the body of Christ, namely Jesus himself. But Jesus identifies with his people now so that Ephesians will say we're we're a living temple built on the, the cornerstone and the foundation. So Hebrews 10, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, by the blood of Jesus, by the life of Jesus, by the work of Jesus, all these different things, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is what? His flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let's draw near. And he'll go on to talk about all that that includes. The point is, Part of Jesus fulfilling the law means he now replaces the curtain that once stood in between humanity and the presence of God. He is the curtain. That temple curtain was just an earthly, material, physical representation of what only Jesus could be. That was never the end desired result was that a curtain would stay there. That was moving humanity towards the ideal so that Jesus would be the way in. What we should ask is, is there anything else that fits under that category of, hey, this was a physical representation of Jesus to be fulfilled by him, and it's played its role, it's fulfilled its outcome, it's achieved its end, and now its use in our time in human history is just to point us to Christ and symbolically represent him. Is there anything else that fits under that category? Well, Paul talks about circumcision in that way. So uh, even when it comes to the temple structure and the way things looked in the temple, you could spend a lifetime (laughs) studying all the different dimensions of the temple and all that was included and find a deep connection to Christ. The point is, Jesus fulfilling the law means he meets the standard and he becomes the way in because he's the only one that's lived perfectly on our behalf to grant us entrance and access to the presence of God. No one else has. He opened the way. He became the way. When there was no way, he fulfilled the law, took our problem, paid our sin, died our death, became the embodiment of human darkness on the cross in his flesh, and now he became the way back to the Father. So he opened that for us. Here's also what it means. I I just want you to pay attention to the intentional temple ceremonial language that is used to refer to how Jesus not only fulfills the law and accomplishes its desired end, but also how he becomes a new and living way. If it's new, let's go to Hebrews 9, okay? Pay attention. Like, please listen. Verse 1. It says, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. Okay? A tent or tabernacle was prepared. The first section in which was the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. By the way, I've done an entire uh, series on Hebrews. You can go check this out. I've done Hebrews 9 in depth. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. 
Okay. Now what the author of Hebrews is about to do is he's taking these two places in the temple. There is the holy place where the priests could go and do their regulations and all their responsibilities. And then there was the most holy place. Only the high priest could go on the day of atonement. So you have these two places. What the author of Hebrews is about to do is he's going to take that first section and he's going to symbolically use that to represent the old and first covenant. And then the most holy place will become, I believe, representative of the new covenant, if I'm not mistaken. I might have to correct that statement a little bit as we go on. I'm not, so don't, don't throw stones at me yet. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, an Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Now these things we can't now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section. Okay? First section. Performing their ritual duties. What does the author of Hebrews connect with the first section? Ritual duties. You might say the sacrificial responsibilities, but also referring to... Uh, I don't know, other washings and cleansings that would have to do with the cleanliness or the uncleanness of the people of Israel. So ritual duties goes beyond just sacrificial responsibilities. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and once a year, not without blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. The first section here is connected to the first covenant, the regulations for worship that revolved around the earthly place, the tabernacle, the temple, right? The first section includes the lampstand, the table, the bread, the presence, all those responsibilities the priests had to tend to and the ritual duties that can all be lumped into what the author says is the first section. Now watch what he says. The first section is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, which is the first section, the old covenant, the first covenant, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. But these gifts and these sacrifices deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest through the greater and more perfect tent, not made, without, not made with hands, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of any animal blood, but by his own blood, securing an eternal redemption. So the time of reformation here is when Jesus appears as our high priest to accomplish the work that no other priest could do. The time of reformation here signals the transition between the old covenant and the new. So what I want you to see is the food and drink washings, regulations for the body. You might say those just have to do with the actual sacrifices. Okay, the problem with that is the washings, uh, the regulations for the body, those were also separate laws in and of themselves, apart from just the sacrifices. You might say food and drink here refers to, you know, the worshiper participating in the offering or sacrifice they bring to the God of Israel. And there's a portion, depending on the offering, there's a portion that they could eat from and or eat and uh, enjoy but food and drink here has to do with what he's been saying food and drink washings regulations for the body it's not limited just to the way uh, someone would worship with an animal sacrifice okay it also has to do with because think about any of the other dietary laws or uh, ceremonial cleansing laws 
those could be still separated from the actual sacrifices themselves. And those dietary laws, when you would adhere to them, when you would do what the Lord said, that was a form of worshiping the God of Israel. Okay? So, I, I just want you to see, I'm not going to say that this for sure eliminates the dietary laws of Israel and they don't apply to the new covenant believers, but I don't think it's not saying that either. <laughs> I'll just say that. This first covenant, Jesus seems to, um, well, I guess let's go on to Ephesians 2 and this will clarify. Because remember he says, as long as the first section is still standing, right? The holy place, the entrance into the holy place is not yet opened. So what's the assumption there? That the first section has to... The first section has to be um, removed. And you say, whoa, 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 hold on. Don't tell me you're saying the Mosaic Law is removed. I'm not going to use that language. I'm going to let Hebrews use that language, okay? I'm going to let Hebrews do the job. Um, where is it? Mm. We'll, go, we'll get to Hebrews 7 when we get to it, okay? Ken, I love you, buddy. You're the best. And there it is. <laughs> ah, I love you guys. You're the best. Okay. I, again, I'm not making any explicit statement about how far we can take this. Just know that when the first section is removed, fulfilled, accomplished by Jesus, part of what is replaced includes the regulations, food and drink, various washings, because the time of reformation refers to when Christ appears to be our high priest, when he accomplishes it. And that also includes what also seems to be attached to that first section is the old regulations for worship and the earthly place of holiness, being the tabernacle, okay? Okay, Ephesians chapter 2. This is a hotly debated passage because of what it says and what it seems to contradict at first. Think of all the temple language that's been put up front already. How Jesus fulfills what the law requires. How he is the embodiment of the law. How he is the way into the true holy of holies. By, by actually, you know, becoming the curtain. And replacing the old symbolic curtain, which was material and earthly in nature. Remember at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision. By what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, by the way. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, watch. So you have the Gentile pagan unbelievers who were cut off from all the benefits of Israel. Now, that doesn't mean a Gentile had no degree of being grafted into the nation. Um, there were converts, for sure. There were people who wanted to take on Judaism and believed in the God of Israel all throughout the Old Testament. Um, how far they could go, though, without that national heritage, without actually descending from Abraham physically, how far they could go in enjoying the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise and all the benefits and blessings that the nation of Israel got to experience as the people. How far they could go, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, I just know there was a degree of access they would have and a degree of participation. I don't believe that proselytes had the same degree of... Well, hold on. <laughs> I'll say that. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So remember, here's that temple language, the way the high priest would go into the most holy place with blood not his own on the day of atonement to atone for the sin of the nation of Israel. Not, an, not intentional sin, but the ritual impurity, you might say. It was almost a ritual impurity reset, the day of atonement. Okay, to cleanse and purge the land of uncleanness. The same way the high priest would go in with blood. Well, Jesus has brought his own blood into the true holy of holies so that we can be drawn near to. Now watch. Watch. 
he himself is our peace, who has made us, Jew and Gentile, both one. And he has broken down in his flesh. Do you remember what Hebrews chapter 10, 19 and 20 said? That he opened for us the curtain through his flesh, right? So watch, in his flesh, he's broken down the dividing wall of hostility. You know what that is? Like, <laughs> we're not even like wondering anymore. That's obviously the curtain, the dividing wall of hostility. Because remember, Jesus' flesh is the new through his life and death and resurrection. Through him, you gain access to the Father. He's the true and living curtain and the true way to the Father. He's what the curtain represented. So the dividing wall of hostility is indeed what we see as the curtain that kept people out of the true Holy of Holies. Now, how has he broken down, you might say, how has he torn the curtain from top to bottom that once kept humanity out of the presence of God. How would you answer that? How would you answer that? How did he do that? Well, Paul's going to answer that very clearly. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. So, no matter what, there was a separation that took place between God and humanity because of sin. The law stood as witness, per Deuteronomy 30 and 31, the law, the book of Moses, stood as witness against us, which said, you can't get into the kingdom because you don't meet the standard of God. There is a dividing wall of hostility and part of Jesus making way for us is that he abolishes the law of commandments. Now hold on. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 explicitly says Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. And you can say, well, that's a poor translation. Let's look it up. Let's look it up. Real time. Right now. Look it up. Ephesians 2.15. Is that a good word? Abolish. Is that the same word Matthew 5.17 uses in the Greek? Let's find out. The ordinances. Ah. There's my kids yelling in the background. Okay. The word here for abolishing means to render inoperative. Like literally to abolish, to make of no effect, to annul, to bring to nothing. <clears throat> okay, so I don't think we're wondering if abolish is the right word. I think we know that's the right word. Bruh, he's saying... That part of Jesus breaking down what kept humanity out of the presence of God, however far that symbolism carries, part of what that means is he abolished the law of commandments. Now, specifically, the ones that are expressed in ordinances. Now, hold on. Paul didn't have to add on that extra description of what the law of commandments are. If you told me the law of commandments, I would go, yeah, you don't need to explain that any further. That's referring to the Torah. That's referring to the law, the book of Moses or the tablets of stone. But he adds on expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, killing the hostility. So, we have Jesus being our peace, making us one new humanity in himself, bringing us, reconciling us to God. How? Well, by breaking down the curtain that separated humanity from God. How? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. And that little description there might be something worth studying. 
is that these don't just seem to refer to the Ten Commandments. Jesus did not abolish the, the moral law of God. Hey guys, morality is not a thing anymore. Just kind of do what you want. It's all grace. He didn't do that. But what does it mean that he nullified, brought to nothing, abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances? Now, I think if we're to be consistent with Ephesians 2, we have to ask, what is it that kept specifically Gentile people and uh, Gentile, you know, Gentile, <laughs> what kept them far off? Because he will say, you know, he's brought us both near to God. Those who were close, those who were near. Yeah, he came and preached peace to you who were far off. That refers to the Gentiles. And peace to those who were near. That can also include converts, proselytes, but specifically the Israelite people who were, had really close proximity to the temple and the tabernacle and the law and, and all that. They, were, you, they had a physical proximity to God that the Gentile nations did not. Right? So in that sense, they were near. Through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So what is it that specifically kept not just Gentiles, but also Jewish people out of the presence of God? Well, you might say it was sin. Okay. I'm, in, I'm to totally in agreement, by the way. I'm not saying it's not sin. But he does say he abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. If we're to be consistent with Hebrews, what is removed, if you go back to Hebrews chapter 8, which by the way, we'll talk about how the, the first covenant is obsolete and growing old, vanishing. I'm not the one making up this language, by the way. I'm literally reading word for word just what it says. Okay. But if we're to be consistent with what Hebrews said, it, it includes this stuff. The law of commandments expressed in ordinances, when Jesus is typically referred to as a high priest um, that becomes or lets us into the, the presence of God or makes a way to the Father, it, that language is usually accompanied with ritual ceremonial kind of language as well such as the, the washings, the regulations, the food and drink. This is connected to Jesus opening a new way, be, you know, by um, doing away with the old way of worshiping in an earthly place of holiness with different regulations. So if you're wondering what my thoughts are, most consistently we can, I think, for certain say, that the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that kept everyone out of the presence of God very simply was um, for sure sin, right? But also think about all the things the high priest had to do on the day of atonement and he's the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies on that day with blood not his own and with the incense, you know, puffing up. Think about all the stuff he had to do, the regulations he had to meet. That seems to be what is also in mind mainly is the ceremonial regulations for an earthly place of worship that had to do with the temple and the animals and the incense and the the blood of goats and bulls and the priesthood that would go in and tend to the stuff and deal with the blood that would go into the basin and wash themselves all those different ordinances that had to do with approaching god that frankly um even if you did them you still couldn't go into the holy of holies because that curtain stood in between you and the and the presence of God, all those ceremonial ordinances seem to be what's in mind here. Okay. Now what you have to ask is, does that also include, and I'm not going to answer that because I don't think it's appropriate to answer it yet, but I think it's worth asking at least. Does that also include dietary laws, laws of clean and unclean animals, laws of clean and unclean touching things, what, what does that include? If it includes circumcision, if it includes um, what we see as the earthly regulations for worship, which the author will explicitly say refers to the food and drink regulations, various washings, we have to ask how far does that go and what is included in that package of what Jesus has annulled or achieved its, its desired end? Because again, it, Ephesians 2 does use the word abolished. So what you and I have to reconcile is this isn't a contradiction in scripture. 
Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He said very clearly he came to fulfill it. When he says that, is there possibly, <laughs> oh man, is there possibly a distinction between the book of Moses, right, um, and the Ten Commandments, Tablets of Stone, which I think I've given enough biblical reasoning and evidence to, to support that claim, that there is a distinction between the two. And if you haven't watched the, the first part of this video, go watch. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Just go listen to my arguments first. But I just wonder, is there a possibility that in Matthew 5, 17, and I'll take you there, that Jesus does come to fulfill everything we see in the Law and the Prophets, right? He does, 100%. Don't think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Is abolishing, okay, um, what's a good way to ask this? If something is removed, is it abolished? If something is, um, I don't know done away with, is it in fact abolished? Because we looked at the word abolished in Matthew 5, 17, and I'll bring it up again. And I know people are going to not like this, but Hebrews 7 specifically is going to talk about how it's passing away. It's coming to nothing. And so you have to reconcile that with Matthew 5, 17 and go, okay, the word abolish here means to overthrow. And I think I said this earlier. To deprive of force, to annul, to discard. I don't think that's what Jesus does with the law. So there, there, there are two ideas spinning around my head as I'm reading this. One idea is this. Jesus didn't come to say the old covenant and the law is, 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 is garbage. I've come to exercise authority and overthrow it and just kind of do away with it. He doesn't do that, number one. But Ephesians 2 does say he's abolished the law of commandments. So is there a category for Jesus has, and I haven't even thought this through all the way, has, is there a category for Jesus fulfills the law and it's done away with, right? But it's not abolished in terms of being completely discarded and, and brought to nothing in terms of this has uh, no place in human history or the people of God and it's not true anymore. I think there is a category for Jesus fulfilling while Ephesians 2 says the, the abolishment of those ordinances is also simultaneously happening. Here's the second thought I have. The entire law and substance points to Jesus. He isn't just the law personified. He's the law. Uh, he fulfills the law and meets the requirements. You know, he's prophetically declared by the law. And the law being the, the, you know, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. So for sure, he is the fulfillment of that. He says it is finished on the cross. Okay. Is there a sense in which Jesus might be distinguishing in his statement on Matthew 5? And then Paul here in Ephesians 2. Is there a distinction being made between what we already established in the beginning of the video, which is the book of Moses, the book of the law, and the Ten Commandments? In other words, is there maybe a category for Jesus has done away with a section, a portion, a category of the law being the ceremonial things while the whole law in and of itself and its entirety has been fulfilled by him not to be overthrown or declared unhelpful at all or this is not from God, right? Is there a way that, that Jesus has done that? And I think as we move forward and read a few more scriptures and answer the question, how are we set free from the law? This, this might become a little more clear. Because when I read this, I'll, I'll be honest, the way I've always read this is, well, he didn't do away with the law, he fulfilled it. But is there a sense in which a part of the law, a portion of it, has actually been rendered and done away with and abolished in that sense? In other words, is it still true, even if Jesus does away with the ceremonial laws and those are abolished, okay, 
is it still true that Jesus came to fulfill the law in its entirety and not abolish it? Sure. In other words, maybe here's the best way to say it. Um, someone says, he abolished the requirements of the law by fulfilling it, but the law itself is truth and still has a purpose. Yeah, I, I, well, I would say him fulfilling it for sure has to do with abolishing the requirements. Um, but then we have to ask, how far does that go? We know it's in terms of salvation, we're not required to do anything. But Well, now for sanctification and obedience, how much of that law still applies? But the point is, I think we can say this. Jesus fulfilled the whole law. Amen. Jesus did not abolish the entire law of Moses, for sure. But there seems to be a section, a portion of the, the book of Moses, the law of Moses, that has been abolished, being that which relates to the physical temple, the ceremonial laws and cleansings and washings. And then we have to ask, is there anything else that might fall under that category? So 